Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Haven of Rest Rescue Mission. My name is John, and I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. And I uh, always thank you for inviting me down here to come and share a little bit about my life, my faith, my God, my Savior. Um, it's hot out tonight, and it's good to be inside here in the AC. But uh, again, thanks for having me. Let me uh, open us up with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for for loving us and saving us through your Son, Jesus Christ, and restoring us and reconciling us back to you and uh, giving us a, a, a new lease on life here on earth and then just the promise of an amazing eternal life forever with you someday. And uh, we just... Uh, you loved us first, and uh, we love you back, and we thank you, and uh, we ask that you just uh, be the teacher here tonight, and that you help us all to cast off the cares and worries and concerns of the day or of the week, and just be at peace right now, Lord, at peace in your presence, and uh, expecting to hear from you in a, in a personal and intimate way, as you always do. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Because it's in the news a lot right now, and uh, the Bible is never outdated, I'm going to just talk a little bit about racism. And I want to start off by saying that racism is an affront to God. Whenever we maintain or perpetuate systems or structures that oppress people based on race, race and or ethnicity, we interfere with God's purpose and with the opportunity for all God's children to be fully who they are created to be. Because Galatians 3.28 says, For all of you are the children of God. All of you, all of us, every single human being that's ever walked this earth is a child of God. And when we see people in any other way than that, we're putting ourselves in a seat of judgment over them, which God expressly forbids. Each person is created in the image of God. Genesis 1, very first chapter in the Bible, right there is that ultimate truth, that ultimate argument that sets itself up against any, any attempt to justify treating people in any other way than equally. Whether you're black or white, Hispanic or Asian, any ethnic group, your primary identity should be found in Jesus Christ and Him alone and Him first. Now, we as followers of Christ will tend to see people in two ways. One of them, either you're saved, born again, walking with the Lord, or you're not. But again, it has nothing to do with your race, your color, your ethnicity at all. And unfortunately, it hasn't always been that way, and nor is it that way right now. And even, you know, in the church, it was said by uh, Martin Luther King Jr. back in the 60s, and to some extent it's still true today, that one of the most segregated hours of the week is 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. That we have people separating by, by race or ethnicity as they come to worship the Lord, you know. It doesn't have to be that way, and I don't believe that that's God's plan, you know. Revelation 5, 9 and 7, 9, they both paint a picture of the great throne room in heaven on the, other si on the other side of this world, on the other side of this life, and it talks about this great multitude of people from every tribe, people, tongue, and nation. never says anything about from any race. From every tribe, people, tongue, and nation. Different cultural groups, sure, different nationalities coming from different parts of the globe may look a little different, you know. Um, someone who lives in an absolutely northern climate, their skin is going to be adapting to hardly seeing the sun at all. Someone in a very desert, hot climate, skin color different, you know. Um, the Bible actually never talks about what, what skin color Adam and Eve were. It's not important. It's not important to God. You come to understand that God is, not, is, is the way it's said in the Bible, is not a respecter of persons. And what that means is God doesn't play favorites. God has no favorites at all. God never looks at what's on the outside of an individual. He always looks at what's on the inside, what's in the heart. It's always about what's in the heart. 
So we're just going to go through a few verses here and just um, my own thoughts and, and, and uh, how I've kind of resolved things or reconciled things in my, in my own life about, about race and other issues uh, relating to, you know, the fact that we look different. But first of all, I just want to say that, it, you know, um, if anybody is not a different color than I am that's in this room or a different color than I am look, or watching on the internet right now, then first of all, I just want to, I want to apologize in advance if I say anything uh, that in, in some way um, would tend to show a lack of sensitivity on my part. It's out of ignorance and it's out of just the fact that I come from, I come at these things from a different vantage point than you do. You know, and I hope you'll have some understanding in your heart about that. My purpose for all of this is to enlighten and to bring reconciliation and greater love for, for all of us together here on this earth. Because that's what Jesus Christ came to do and I want to follow what he did and I hope you do too. For those of you that look like me, um, I would say that uh, don't think that I'm picking on you at all because I'm not. Um, Okay, and and and, and, should, and let, let me even clear that up. This is not. There's nothing accusatory at all in what we're going to talk about. We're just going to be talking about the Bible. You know, that's the great great thing about the Bible. Again, is it is timely. You know, it was written um, some passages 3,500 years ago. Um, Moses is writing the book of Genesis, and it's still just as timely today as it was 3,500 years ago. These truths are biblical truths. They're the truths of the Creator God of the universe that is. You know, in Isaiah, he says, my ways are higher than your ways, and we can never fully understand him or fathom him, but um, it, is, it is fundamental, transformational truth, you know. So um, I hope that uh, from what I say here tonight that uh, it may give you pause to think, reflect, maybe make some uh, modifications to your behaviors, to your beliefs, you know, all of it in just reaching across the aisle and promoting greater unity and uh, greater love for, for one another. And uh, lastly, um, you know, as I talk about racism, I'm going to freely confess that I've made plenty of mistakes myself in that area, and that there's been times in my life that I exhibited a lack of sensitivity, or in some ways uh, went along with something, or just spoke a word here or there without thinking, and you know, um, I regret that, and I've made my peace with it with God and Jesus Christ, and that's how it is, you know. Um, I serve a forgiving God, and... Uh, he, he forgives any and all, richly, quickly, and lovingly when we come to him. So. so with that, question, what does the Bible say about racism, prejudice, and discrimination? Well, it says that all human beings are equally created in the image and likeness of God. So the first thing you have to understand is that there is only one race, the human race. Caucasians, Africans, Asians, Indians, Arabs, Jews... They're not different races, rather they're ethnicities, they're different ethnicities of the human race. All human beings have the same physical characteristics with minor variations, of course. But again, all human beings are equally created in the image and likeness of God. The Bible, chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him, male and female, he created them. And you know, we have a common ancestry because of that. We have a common ancestry. Just a little side note here, 3,500 years ago, as I referenced before, Moses wrote in Genesis that Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living things, G Genesis 3.20, okay? According to the Bible, all humans descend from one common mother. Evolutionary scientists were unconvinced of this fact until 1987. After extensive analysis of mitochondrial DNA, which is the section of human genetic code passed down intact from mother to child, samples taken from placentas around the world, the research concluded that all humans today come from a common ancestral female. Scientifically proven. We all come from one woman at some point back in, in our history. The ramifications of that are staggering. You know. 
first of all, that there, there really is no difference between us. You know, we're all physically, biologically come from one mother, and we're all created in God's image, you know. So we have absolutely no basis to look, at, look down on anybody else around us, in any way judge anybody else for something, the way they look, where they came from, you know, how they act, whatever the deal is, you know. We're just not, we're, we all have that in common. Several years later, studies also concluded that all humans descend from one common male parent. And little did these researchers realize that all their effort and expense would simply confirm the accuracy of the Bible. And now maybe a little nearer to us now, but back in 2003, National Geographic did a whole show over a series of Sundays where they did kind of the same thing. And they analyzed DNA from people in all regions of the world. And a geneticist by the name of Spencer Wells concluded that all humans alive today are descended from a single man. And he addressed this issue in his book, The Journey of Man, A Genetic Odyssey, and a, and a National Geographic documentary of the same title back in 2003. In a straightforward story, he explains how he traced the roots of modern humans from Africa by analyzing genetic changes in DNA from the Y, y chromosome. As often happens in science, he said, technology has opened up a field to new ways of answering old questions, even providing startling answers. It's physically, genetically, DNA able to be proved that we all come from the same one person. We all have a, that, that common parent to us. All right. And here's just another interesting sideline. The human body has the identical makeup of dirt or dust. While chapter 1 of Genesis presents a concise history of how God created the world, chapter 2 fills in the details, particularly with regard to the creation of humans. Genesis 2.7, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now, when I was a kid, I heard that. I just thought that was sort of, I didn't know what a meta, the word metaphor meant, but I think it was just some kind of an imagery. God just took dirt and, you know. But although the Lord created the heavens and the earth from nothing, he chose to create the first man from dust. And present-day biologists affirm this fact. In a way, the body seems almost unimpressive. The 20-odd commonplace chemical elements that compose the human body are all present in the earth's dry dust. Isn't that interesting? While the human body is composed of such lowly elements, it is nonetheless a miraculous piece of craftsmanship put together with approximately 75 trillion living cells, each one with a specific role to play. We truly are a masterpiece of the ultimate creator God. And again, and we have this in common, that we all come from this, we share this, this common ancestry. Psalm 139, 14, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works that my soul knows very well. So what, again, what does the Bible say about racism, prejudice, and discrimination? I said first that we're all created in, in the image and likeness of God. Next, we, some of us are familiar with the, ver the very famous verse, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he sent Jesus Christ, you know, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. But it says that he loves the world, not that he loves one ethnic group, or another, or one, you know, one country, or one nation. You know, there's some confusion about that with the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. I'm going to get to that in just a second. Another thing, God does not show partiality or favoritism. Deuteronomy 10:17. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who is not partial and takes no bribes. Acts 10:34. This is where Peter was being confronted by the fact that he was pe treating people differently. And so Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality. Romans 2.11, for God shows no partiality. Ephesians 6.9, masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours in heaven, and that there is no partiality with him. God shows no partiality, and neither should we. James 2.4 says, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? And he's describing the fact that we will judge other people. It just seems to be something that came along pretty quick after the creation and the fall that we began to look at other people. You know, 
God created this idyllic paradise in Genesis chapter 1, and by Genesis chapter 11, all, all of mankind has been scattered in a different direction under different languages to go and do their own thing and, and seeks separation and disunity from each other, right? And in the end, conflict as well. It only took 11 chapters in, in the, the massive book for us to decide that we're going to go our own way. Now, in the Old Testament, God divided humanity into two ethnic groups, Jews and Gentiles. The nation of Israel, the Jews, and Gentiles. God's intent was for the Jews to be a kingdom of priests ministering to the Gentile nations. Instead, for the most part, the Jews became proud of their status and despised the Gentiles. Did absolutely the opposite of what God had intended for them to be doing with that, with that blessing. Jesus Christ put an end to this, destroying the dividing wall of hostility. As it says in Ephesians 2.14, For he himself is our peace, speaking of Jesus, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. I will say this, all forms of racism, prejudice, and discrimination are affronts to the work of Christ on the cross. In other words, they stand in direct opposition to them. Jesus commands us to love one another as he has loved us. John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. God, if God is impartial and loves us with impartiality, then we need to love others with that same high standard that Jesus has. Jesus teaches us in Matthew 25 that whatever we do to the least of his brothers, we do to him. If we treat a person with contempt, we're mistreating a person created in God's image. We're hurting somebody whom God loves and for whom Jesus Christ also died for. Racism or prejudice or discrimination or bigotry in, in its varying forms and to various degrees has been a plague on humanity for thousands of years. Those who practice racism, prejudice, and discrimination need to repent of it. Like it says in Romans 6.13, Present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. And may Galatians 3.28 be completely realized. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now, if you've been a victim of racism, prejudice, or discrimination of some kind, Ephesians 4.32 declares, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. The true answer is for those of us that have in any way leaned towards racism, we need to ab abandon that, we need to repent of that, we need to go before God and have our hearts checked and surrender that to Him. And then those of us that have been on the receiving end of that, it's going to be tough. But, it, but we have to practice what Christ did, you know, because we're never more like Christ than when we're unfairly accused, when we're unfairly treated, when we're unjustly treated, you know. And if we're followers of Christ, then we're, we're told to forgive, you know, especially the ones that, that we don't want to forgive and it hurts the most. But can you imagine the, the reconciliation that can come about in this town, in this country, in this world, if all of these big, this bigotry, prejudice, discrimination, all that stuff gets put down from both sides and we can all you know, come together in unity like God has intended us for to be. That's the picture that God has. It's certainly what's going to happen when we're in heaven together in that great throne room. But it also, every one of us can in some way control our reality around us right now and make, put a small dent into that right now. Make no mistake about it, the Bible makes a strong case against racism. And I say that because at one point, believe it or not, racists actually use the Bible to try to justify their racist behavior. And that's a, a whole other lesson. We can go into a lot of detail for another time. All right. Just know for right now tonight that the Bible makes a strong case against racism. While the Bible has often been twisted and misused, the truth is that Scripture makes a strong case against racism, racism and for racial equality. The Bible clearly asserts that the value of a person comes from his or her creator. Again, as I mentioned in Genesis 1.27, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. 
Male and female, he created them. So if you think about it, all of humankind is the work of the ultimate master artist. And if you think about that, an original painting by Picasso can sell for $30 million, but you can buy a, a print, a fa you know, a low value copy for 25 bucks, or maybe even less than that, right? You know, it's the fact, it's the uniqueness of the original. Well, guess what? Each and every one of us, if we read Psalm 139, we are unique individual masterpieces, every single one of us, no two, no two human beings alike. A masterpiece made by the master artist. How dare you or me mistreat one of God's masterpieces? Look down on, in some way judge. No way. The biblical truth asserts the value of all people and leaves no room for racism. In the Bible, God doesn't ever make distinctions based on physical or social attributes. When the prophet Samuel was sent to go anoint the next king of Israel um, after, after King Saul, Samuel was sent to, to King David's family, and uh, even, even the, the prophet Samuel, who, you know, a man of God, had the anointing of God on him, was, was, was the mouthpiece of God, he was convinced that he, that he was probably going to be picking someone who was going to be impressive looking. You know, after all, King Saul, that's what the, the people had picked too, someone that looks like a king, right? And then if you know the story, he went through and brought all of David's brothers out from the, from the biggest on down, and nope, that he's not the guy, he's not the guy, he's not the guy. And then it's like, well, do you have any, any, any other sons? And they say, well, yeah, there's my little, you know, my little David. He's out there tending sheep, you know. And you bring him in, and that's it. He's the, he's the anointed of God, you know. Because, again, as some, a lot of you know, I'm sure, God looks at what's in the heart, not on the outside, you know. Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. 1 Samuel 16, 17. In the New Testament book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul writes, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor there is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. That's Galatians 3, 28. The Bible, again, is very clear. God invented equality and social justice. It's a popular term nowadays, social justice warrior, you know. The Bible had it 3,000 years ago, with Paul 2,000 years ago. The Bible tells us to consider others before ourselves. Throughout Scripture, God encourages people to treat others with respect and dignity. In the Apostle Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, he tells the new believers, In humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. It's Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4. Anyone looking to the Bible to justify his own mistreatment of others is going to be sorely disappointed because it's just not there. The Bible states that God calls us to be reconciled, and he's serious about it. The Bible advocates for people to resolve their differences and be reconciled, whether it's in your family, in a faith community, or in a nation in conflict. The Bible always advocates that reconciliation be sought wherever possible. And why not? Because God himself is the ultimate resurrector, reconciler, repairer, restorer. You know, he can bring his own son back from the dead. He can bring any broken relationship back from the dead, too. He can reconcile and restore. This means so much to God that in Matthew 5, verses 23 and 24, he says this, Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or your sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar, First go and be reconciled to them, then come back and offer your gift. God is so serious about reconciliation that he does not want our gift, our time, our talent, or our treasure, whatever it is that we're bringing to him, until we've done our best to resolve any particular conflict that exists in our lives at that particular time. So the Bible makes a strong case against, pre uh, against prejudice and for reconciliation. But how do we do it? How do we, how do we end ra racism? How do we heal all the wounds? Fortunately, the Bible gives us a place to start. Book of Wisdom in the Bible is Proverbs. Book of Proverbs sends a wake-up call to the person who's overly impressed with himself, saying, a fool finds no pleasure in understanding, but delights in airing his own opinions. That's Proverbs 18.2. The implication is that if you don't want to be a fool, you should seek to understand others rather than broadcast a monologue of your own opinions. 
And in the New Testament, James 1.19 says, Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. So in other words, one of the solutions is talk less and listen more. Seek to understand another person's position before stating your own. Hey, maybe try this. Don't even state your own position. Maybe just come to really listen to someone else's position and say, hey, you know what, I never thought about it that way. I'm going to see what I can do to, to better understand your position. That's it. It's not about making a point. It's not about winning an argument. You know, it's about understanding each other. Because remember, friends, in the end, Jesus said that the most important thing we can do is to love our neighbors. When pressed with the question, well, who is my neighbor? He told the story of love that crossed racial and religious lines between Jews and Samaritans, and he talked about the Good Samaritan story, remember? Where a Samaritan man helped a wounded Jew. The Samaritans were like the sworn enemies of the Jews. They hated them. They were these, these dirty, filthy Gentiles. There was a perfect example of, of, of discrimination and, and bigotry and, you know, and injustice on the part of the Jewish people towards a particular group of people. And yet it was the Samaritan that, that turned around and took care of the Jew that had been set upon by thieves and left for dead. A strong lesson here is that love and compassion should always trump the divisions that we have between us. I mean, it, you know, most of you here are believers, and you understand we're to love each other. I mean, God is love. He describes himself as love. And, and, and it can seem overly simplistic and even a platitude that, you know, just all, like a Beatles song, you know, all you need is love, you know. But, it, but on a foundational truth level, that is what it takes. And, and, but on the other hand, that's all that it's going to take, is just love. Come at each other from a position of love instead of any other position. Put aside any other agenda that you have about making a point or, or somehow trying to right a wrong or to make up for past wrongs or anything, you know. You just forgive. Like Jesus on the cross, you know, forgive them, Father. They, don't, they know not what they do. Think about that. Most of the people that have ever wronged me in the end, I don't even think they had any real idea what they'd done to me, you know. And the real hurt was all in my own making, in my own mind, and building all that up, you know. And when you come to just accept things and, and trust in the Lord and understand that, that, that you know, He's on my side and, and He's going to make all things right, wow, you can really save yourself a lot of heartache. So the cure for racism is humility and compassion. The wounds of racism will only begin to heal as people of all races seek to understand one another. True racial reconciliation in our nation here will take time, but we have to pursue it, folks. And the Bible can help us to take the next step towards healing. I'm going to reread John 13, 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also must love one another. And remember, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. So here's his command to love one another. If I'm not, love, not loving one another, then, you know, am I really loving Jesus? Me who claims to be a follower of Christ. Ouch. Yeah, so... Um, I'm going to close in prayer because uh, you can't talk about racism without reconciliation, which I think we did. But then ultimately, we all have to be reconciled to our holy God first before we can take this message of love. Because any of us without Christ, I don't believe we have the capacity to really love other people in, a, you know, in the deepest sense of the word, sacrificial love, until we have Christ in us. Because I can't give that kind of love on my own. I don't have it, you know. And so I need Christ in me before I can then be what God wants me to be and become a, a uniter and a reconciler and a restorer and a repairer of relationships. I've got to have Christ in me. And if you don't have Christ in you, it's very simple. You just have to surrender your life to Him. God loves us so much that He sent His Son 2,000 years ago to die on that cross to pay the penalty for our sins. Because as I said earlier too, we all tend to want to go our own way. Like I said, it didn't take until Genesis chapter 11. 11 chapters in, everybody went their own way. Everybody went their own way. I mean, actually, it's sooner than that. It took just two, three chapters in. The two main people in the Garden of Eden decided to go their own way. 
But from then on, it only took 11 more chapters for the entire world to be contaminated with that, that sense of, of, of me and myself and, and my own agenda. And we, and, and we, have, we have to give that up. It just doesn't work. It'll never work in your life. You, if you friend are out there in the internet or here in this room and you, you're finding that you've been banging your head against the wall, it's because we've got it wrong, you know. We follow, we follow a GPS plan that has me at the center of it, that the map, it's a map of me and I'm trying to navigate everything around my life with me at the center of it, you know. And what really works, God has the real GPS and it's God in the center. And I have to take my GPS, you know, change the screen. It's, it's like going to a new city, you've got to reprogram it, right? I've got to reprogram my GPS to be about God and focusing on God. And when I focus on God, it's amazing how well my life begins to work when I'm focusing on Him and His purposes, and I'm, I'm loving everybody else, you know, loving others the way God has loved me. Things fall into place. Things make sense. I have a purpose in my life. So, so let's just pray. Let's just pray. Father God, thank You for teaching us, Lord, and thank You for being a God who describes Himself as, as love. You simply say it, I am love. And perfect love casts out all fear. No condemnation in Christ Jesus. Any one of us can come to you, Lord. And so if there's anybody here within the sound of my voice that has never turned their life over to Jesus, that has received your son Jesus as their Lord and Savior, then Lord, through your Holy Spirit, just draw them to you right now. Give them the courage, the strength to just say yes to you. And friend, if that's you right there right now, it's that simple. You just say yes to God. You say yes to Jesus. Just say, yes, God, I know that I'm a sinner. Yes, Jesus. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Yes, Jesus, come into my life and show me how to live from this point on. Show me how to love others when it doesn't come naturally to me. Show me how to be a, re a restorer and a repairer and a reconciler and a resurrector of things, Lord, just like you are. Show me how to do all these things that I just don't have the power to do without you. I surrender right here, right now, my will and my life to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Give God a hand. Anybody here that had not ever said that prayer before, that said it for the first time here tonight? Anybody on the internet, if that was you, we would love to hear from you. I mean, we celebrate these things here. Um, the Bible even teaches us to celebrate that. There's more celebrating in heaven over one lost sheep that's found than over 99 that wouldn't think they were lost. So um, pick up the phone, give us a call, shoot us an email, come down in person here. We'd love to, we'd love to get to meet you. Um, you need anything, we can try to help you out. You need a Bible, you need some prayer, you need healing, come on down. And then thank you guys for listening. It's always a pleasure to be here. You know, it's kind of some strange times. I don't know if you guys are wearing masks here or not. It's kind of hard to, kind of hard to teach or speak with, a, with it on, so thank you. Hope I wasn't spitting too much on you, Doug. Hey, that wouldn't bother me at all. I've had worse yeah, things yeah, on yeah. Right. So then uh, you're, you guys are all going to stick around for the meal, I hope, and I will say a quick blessing over the food. Father God, thank you for this mission. Thank you for all the food that you just have pouring into this mission seven days a week, pretty much. And uh, thank you for the hardworking staff and volunteers that, that, that receive that food. They, they, they catalog the food. They store it. They give most of it back out. They keep some of it here and prepare it for those that come in here to eat. And uh, we thank you so much for that, Lord. You're just, your hand is just in all this, and your provision is, is, is amazing and, and hard to comprehend sometimes. But thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, God. And uh, we freely receive this food, Lord. Please bless it to our bodies. Bless our bodies to... To your glory, may everything we say and everything we do just bring glory to you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Amen. Thank you guys.